welcome to Friday's Live. Uh, I am your host today. I'm Rose. I'm Find My Past's resident newspaper expert. So do let us know where you're tuning in from. I can see uh, Shirley has already joined us uh, from sunny Cambridgeshire. Hello there, Shirley, over on uh, YouTube. It is um, it's a sunny day here in London. It's actually still really warm. I can't I can't believe the uh, the weather we've been having um, over here at the moment. It's been it's been something else. Um, lovely September weather. Uh, I can see we've got Gillian joining us all the way from uh, Winnipeg. Uh, Andrew is in a, a nice and dry Lancashire, and Andrea is in a cloudy Stoke on Trent. I think it's I think it's got ah, I think it started to get slightly overcast here in London. Um, we've got Jenny from a sunny Devon. Patricia joining from Cyprus. Hello, Patricia. Uh, we've got the lovely Ellie in the comments today. So um, do say hello. Um, so we've got a plan set. We've got a packed session today. Um, we've got new and exclusive records um, from the London Borough of Southwark and some very special newspapers as well. And to mark uh, our brand new uh, three month premium subscription, which we uh, launched just this week, it, which it will include the 1921 census, um, we're going to take a look at the 1921 census today. We're going to do um, a deep dive into village life um, in the 1921 census. So sort of a snapshot um, of a rural community at the time of 1921. We're just seeing who else we've got with us today. Uh, we've got Matthew, we've got uh, Sarah in a wet Wexford. Sorry, it's raining over there, um, Sarah. We've got Heather, it's raining in Edinburgh as well. Oh no. Uh, Berenice uh, in Birmingham. We've got Anne. Andrea, hello, hello. Virginia joining us from Ohio. Gina, uh, dryish in uh, Northern Ireland with Linda. And it's lovely and sunny in Queens, New York with Joella. Hello. And um, Gina is uh, joining us from a sunny Lancashire, Lincolnshire either. either. Get my words together. <laughs> anyway, uh, so... Um, uh, our question of the week is also uh, census uh, based. Um, it is, what is the most unusual thing that you have come across in a census record? Um, it's, what is the most unusual thing that you have come across in a census record? So we will come back to that later, uh, but first we're going to dive into our new records of the week. And we'll see, we've got a few more joining us as well. Um, Shari in the United States, Victoria, it's warm in uh, sunny in Suffolk, uh, Anya in a dryish in Fife. Um, and yeah, Anya, we will we'll send that warmth um, your way. So I'm very, very excited. I'm always excited by our new records of the week, but I am particularly um, excited this week. Uh, we have uh, new records um, from Southwark Archives. So this is a really exciting new partnership that we have with uh, the Southwark Record Office. So that's in the uh, London borough of Southwark, so just south of the river. And we've got Southwark baptisms, marriages, burials and congregational records spanning the years um, 1781 through to 1984. Um, oh, I'm correcting my um, my pronunciation there. Drish, Drish. Okay, <laughs> that's a new one for me. Thank you, um, Linda. There, um, and we've also got four brand new newspapers this week, and they span the years 1823 through to 1902. So let's take a look at our Southwark records of the week. Um, so baptisms, marriages and burials, as well as congregational records. And we have nearly uh, 40,000 brand new and exclusive records. And these are uh, from non-conformist denominations. So we're looking at uh, Baptists, uh, the congregational lists, also known as independents and Methodists. And these come from locations across the borough of Southwark. So we're looking at Borough, Bermondsey, Camberwell, uh, East Dulwich, Horsley Down, Peckham, uh, Rotherhithe and Woolworth. Um, and I'm really excited by these records uh, in particular because I used to live in Borough, um, actually. So it's a place that's very close to my heart. And of course, Southwark has uh, an incredibly rich history. Uh, it's famed for historically being outside of the jurisdiction of the city of London on the south bank on the, of the Thames. So it was where uh, theatres uh, sprang up during the Elizabethan era. So you've got theatres like the Rose and most famously the Globe uh, alongside um, gambling dens, bowling alleys and other places of more 
let's say, dubious repute. Um, and there's still lots and lots of history to be seen around Southwark. Um, I would really recommend uh, a trip to the George Inn. You can just see a photograph there of it. Uh, it's photographed uh, in 1964 there in one of our newspapers. And it's London's only surviving galleried inn. And it was built in 1676. And there's a, there's a lot of the original architecture still intact. Um, so it's a great place uh, to go uh, if you're in the area. And so it's kind of fitting that we have these non conforming records this week, so that being a, a famous epicenter of um, sort of counterculture. Uh, but by the early, early 20th century, Southwark was actually quite a poor place. It was one of the poorest um, areas in London. And you find illustrations like this one, um, as late as the 1930s, as the, that other illustration there. And this title is, uh, for this picture is from the Illustrated London News. And the title reads, The Slums Must Go. So this is a depiction of a street in Southwark that shows the typical congestion there. And that's from 19. 1933. So I think this is something that we perhaps would associate with the Victorian era slums and crowded living conditions, but it was a very real issue in Southwark as late as this. Um, anyway, I could go on um, talking about the history of Southwark uh, for a little while, um, but let's uh, take a look at some of these wonderful records. Um, and uh, they are really extra, extra special this week um, because we have a celebrity um, among us, uh, none other than the poet uh, Robert Browning. And he actually appears in our uh, Southwark Baptism Records. And the uh, Baptism Records this week, they consist of uh, congregational, congregationalist baptisms. Um, Baptists, of course, they, they don't have their, their infant or, or child baptisms. And it's in these congregationalist records that we find the baptism of Robert Browning um, at the uh, York Street Chapel in Woolworth. And what I, what I should have said straight up is this wonderful collection has uh, images of the original records. So this, this is great. There's some lovely, lovely documents here uh, for you to take a look at. And you can see uh, the transcription there for Robert Browning's um, baptism. Uh, it's a lovely and detailed transcript um, to go alongside the image. Uh, we learn his birthday, which was the 7th of May, 1812. Um, how old he was at baptism. So he was one month old. Uh, the names of his parents, they were Robert and Sarah Anna Browning. And there's a lovely picture of the poet there um, with a signature, which was printed in the Illustrated London News in February 1953. So the York Street Chapel, where Robert Browning was baptised, actually became known as the Browning Chapel in honour uh, of the poet. And um, York Street, where it stood, actually became known as Browning Street. Let's see, we've got a few more joiners. We've got Karen joining us from um, South London. Hello, Karen. Um, Rosie has uh, spent a lot of time in Southwark lately, uh, virtually, uh, with family and also um, reading Shakespeare's local Read the George well worth the read. Oh, amazing stuff. And um, Anya, some possible links to Southwark. Very exciting. Uh, Pickles, welcome. Welcome. And Lynn joining um, from BC. Uh, so we also have marriages and the, the marriages, uh, the records, they consist of Baptist and uh, Methodist records and they are from um, Bur Borough, Bermondsey, Camberwell and Peckham. And again, there's, there's some great details here in this collection. And this is a marriage uh, in 1928 between um, Leonard Henry George Churchley, who was a warehouseman, and Winifred Amelia Medhurst. And that was at the Mays Pond Baptist Church on, old, on the Old Kent Road. So we get the names of their fathers as well as their addresses. And we also have some great local newspapers from this area as well, just something to point out. So we've got, um, for example, the um, Southwark and Bermondsey Recorder. And I found this little article uh, from, from a year before um, Henry and Winifred's marriage. Uh, so that's 1927 about the Mays Pond Baptist Church and how it was celebrating its 15th anniversary. So you get some really um, lovely uh, contextual information there. And the um, burial records, they're actually the oldest ones um, this week. Um, they come from the York Street Chapel and the Collier's Rents Chapel. And this is the beautiful front page of the burial register of the Collier's Rents Chapel. Uh, so this is from um, 1783. And it's just this beautiful, beautiful handwriting, which I, I just adore. And it reads, um, a register of persons buried in the burial ground, joining Mr. Rogers's meeting 
House in Collier's Rents, Southwark. And this is the transcript for the burial of Mrs. Sophia Croft on 13th of December, 1783. And as you can see, uh, the original record there, it, it, is, it is sparse, pretty sparse, but it, it is historic. We are talking about uh, 1783 here. And I also find it really touching that above Sophia's record, um, there is a burial record there for a stillborn child. So just, you know, it is anonymous, but I think it's quite moving that that has been um, recorded in um, some sort of way. And uh, finally, um, we have the congregational records, and these really sort of reflect the life of the community uh, with outreach records, um, Sunday school admission records, and another type of record here, which is wonderfully fascinating. Um, they're called the Band of Hope Pledges. Um, and the Band of Hope was a, was a temperance movement, and these pledge books survive to this day. And uh, you see uh, one, uh, an example reproduced here for the record of Florence MLR uh, Goddard from the 20th of November 1922. Now Florence was 16 at the time and what she's done here is she's pledged at the Hanover, Hanover Road Chapel in Peckham to abstain from all intoxicating drinks as beverages. And you can see that she has signed this pledge alongside um, other young women and men, uh, ranging from the ages of 14 to 18. And you can just you can just see there that there's the different handwriting there. So it looks like that they've signed these themselves. And you also get the address there. So you get address and age, so some, some good useful information there. There's some really interesting information in, in creating context around uh, Florence's life, that she was a supporter of the, the temperance movement. And again, our newspapers have some great contextual information for this particular movement. Um, we have a temperance newspaper, which is called um, On the March, which was published at, around this time. Uh, and you can see a clipping there uh, for the scientific authority of for total abstinence. And that was published in 1918. Um, so this might have been something that was read by these young people um, signing their pledges. So that's it from our wonderful um, Southwark records. There's, there's a, really a lot to enjoy with these. And um, as Ellie says, it's just great to see the handwriting um, on these uh, original records. Uh, so a big thank you to our, um, our partners, the Southwark Archives. And here is a lovely montage of our new newspapers this week. Uh, so representing Kent, we've got the Kent Times, Tombridge and Sevenoaks Examiner, which was founded in Tombridge in 1857. Interesting fact about Tombridge at this time, it was actually called Tunbridge, but it changed its name in uh, 1870 to Tombridge to avoid confusion with Tunbridge Wells. And representing Surrey, we've got the Epsom Journal, which was founded in 1862. And also joining us is Liverpool Saturday's Advertiser. I find this one a bit of a mouthful for whatever reason, um, but it is a wonderfully historic Liverpudlian newspaper. Um, so it was founded very early on in, in the 19th century, about 1806. We've got lots of shipping intelligence. Um, you've got details of arrivals and departures from the Liverpool docks. It's also very much known for its uh, account of the Peterloo Massacre. And last but no means least is uh, The Schoolmaster, an Edinburgh weekly magazine. And this educational title was founded in 1832 by husband and wife duo uh, John and Christian Johnston. They were radicals uh, politically. They were uh, disappointed in the 1832 Reform Act, Reform Act which uh, rejigged uh, the electoral system in the United Kingdom. Um, they believed it simply didn't go further enough. Um, so they founded the Schoolmaster as a journal to put out information of every kind and to educate people who did not yet have the vote to sort of prepare them for when they were given the vote. Um, so it's, it's filled with lots of different types of articles, most of which were penned by John and Christian themselves. And Christian Johnson is a really fascinating figure. Um, so not only um, was she an author, and you can read actually read some of her fiction in The Schoolmaster, um, she was a journalist, and she was a newspaper editor at a time when, well, it was really much, very much a man's world. So the schoolmaster would uh, go on later to be absorbed by another Edinburgh title that was um, Tate's Edinburgh magazine. And Christian actually acted as the editor of this particular publication for 12 years. And I went into our newspaper collection because that's 
always a good place to start. And um, she actually begins to be celebrated about 100 years or so after her death. Um, so you can see an article there on the left hand side from the Edinburgh Evening News in July uh, 1957, which dubs her as um, Scotland's pioneer woman journalist. And then we've got another piece there on um, the right um, from the Scotsman from May 1960, uh, which compares her to Mrs. Beaton and also calls her highly intelligent. So um, really um, fascinating and inspiring uh, women there. OK. So that's our uh, our new uh, newspapers and records this week. And now uh, on to our, our question of the week, which is what is the most unusual thing you have come across in a census record? Or perhaps we could think about the you know, most, most surprising or, or unexpected thing um, that uh, we have come across in, um, in a census record. So I, I think, over the years, we have I've come across some interesting things, particularly in 1921. I think we, we've seen pet paw prints. I think that has to be uh, one of my one of my favourite and most unusual things that uh, I've come across. Um, and Andrew has got a fascinating find here. Some point across 1861, back Piccadilly in Manchester. If these girls were dressmakers, milliners, etc., how did the enumerator know they were also prostitutes? very interesting that you know and that that's that sort of that that coded language as well from from these these times um yeah that really sort of fascinating really fascinating find there um 1861 gosh um and we've got kim billy um finding my second and third great crown parents in the 1821 census this really for when farthing they included their age occupation and relationships this is unusual for the time but good for research it's so unusual for the time so i think i believe censuses first started i believe it was in 1801 um but they weren't sort of formalized in, in that modern sense that we know until 1841 so there were there were censuses taken in in, in those intervening years between 1801 and uh, 1841 and Kim you're so lucky that you've got you can you've got that link to 1821 census that is that is amazing um Ellie um my great grandparents both signing their 1921 census record I love that oh that's so nice um and um I see Gillian um giving one of my grand uncles as basket weaver so perhaps that was an, an, an um, unexpected um occupation and even just like the surprising finds like my um my um, Cumberland based ancestors were in Manchester in the 1921 census and I really didn't expect to find them there and they were they were running a uh, grocery and they were living next door to and um, some I think they were uh, they were acrobats from Japan, which I thought was amazing that they they were they were in Manchester at the time as well, um, and um, we've got Bethan here. Something unexpected. I was looking for extended family in 1921, hoping to find some living cousins for DNA. I found a white chain living with a family. I spent months searching for my three times great grandmother to no avail. Her name was Jane White. I was so excited when I saw her name back to front. Oh, that is such a win. That's wonderful. Um, and yes, yeah, just something to remember because, you know, sometimes these, these names were sort of recorded the other way around. Um, so that's actually a, a good tip um, for, for breaking those um, um, brick walls. And Ellie shared that um, uh, lovely record of, of her grandparents there. So keep keep those answers coming through and we um we will go on to have a look at um a little study a little investigation into the 1921 census um so what we love about the census is i think is that snapshot of a community that it presents at the time you know that it is that snapshot of a night in a particular year where anything could be you know we might have a newborn baby in the house you know it is it's just such a fascinating um, moment in time. Oh, and Bethan's got one. Um, do you keep do you keep them coming? Um, Bethan is a fluent Welsh speaker, um, and I thought I was the first in my family. But it turns out I come from a long line of Welsh speakers. Some who couldn't even speak English. Oh, and that is amazing. And like having that detail in the census as well, that around language is, is so is so lovely. So you can you can find out um, your heritage. That 
that is that is really fabulous. Um, so, and, and Anya, um, we've got a four times great grandfather giving his place of birth as German Ocean on the 1851 census. His father was a soldier in the Napoleonic Wars, and so he was born while on a ship going across from mainland Europe back to the UK, which shows his mother was on campaign with her husband. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Very, very <laughs> literal German Ocean. I love that so much. Um, how wonderful. Um, it's just so vivid. I, I'm, getting, I'm, getting, I'm getting all the sharp vibes as well. Whenever someone mentions the Napoleonic Wars, my, my mind just goes sharp, Sean Bean. <laughs> Um, so 1921. Um, so 1921 was such a time of immense change. Um, community still very much coming to terms with the devastation of the First World War, um, and also getting getting to grips with this sort of strange new modern age. These these new inventions, the age of the motor car, um, the new age of jazz. Um, so I really love looking through and um, browsing through uh, our 1921 census records to look. At communities and today I've chosen to focus on the community the village of Thistleworth in West Sussex so uh, down on the south coast I guess it's about um, near the south downs about half an hour away um, from the sea so we're using uh, Fitterworth as an example to explore and um, investigate all the different elements that make up a community and I found this very lovely picture of Fitzworth um, from the Illustrated Sporting and Dramatic News uh, in October 1910. And um, you can just about make out there that there's a group of um, uh, little children and um, some adults there as well. And um, it just makes you wonder sort of what happened to them in the intervening time between when this photo was taken in 1910 and 1921. So you might find this um, useful if you are doing a, a one place study of finding all you can out about a place in a particular time period um, but it's also just a great uh, uh, great um, investigation for unraveling the stories of those who featured in the 1921 census and let's get into it and pickles has some ancestors from Fitterworth. Oh, what a coincidence. That's amazing. Um, so, yeah, and I should just say the reason that I pick Fitterworth um, is that I grew up near Fitterworth in a, in a very small hamlet. Um, I don't actually have any um, ancestors from, from the area, um, but it, it's, a, it's a place that's really close to, um, to my heart. Um, so starting out, um, uh, you can use the address search of course to find your place in the 1921 census but I just did a, a simple search here uh, location in 1921 it's Fitterworth uh, popping that in the location bar and then narrowed my search results down to exact and then you can see some of my lovely results there um, but before diving into um, the records of the people of Fitterworth from 1921 I wanted to take a look at the um, makeup of the parish and Matthew Donovan with a Fitterworth ancestors too back in the 17th century. Well, this is remarkable because it's only a very small village. What a coincidence. I love this. We're all connected. How wonderful. <laughs> um, and oh, we've got some more um, answers for our question of the week as well. Um, Graham, finding my uh, three times great grandparents in the US 1860 census. It was news to me as they were also in the UK 1851 and 1861 censuses. They're, they're moving about, <laughs> remarkable. Um, and, um, and Kim? and found her granddad were as a working people on a farm on Redditch for the 1921 census, arranged by his uncle as he was a bit of a troubled teen. His mum was on holiday in Bridlington. And yeah, it's just, it's, it's really, when, when, we come, when we stumble across these records of our ancestors, when they're, when they're, when they're in places we've not expected them to be, um, it's always so fascinating to find that out and why that might have been. Um, so, um, <clears throat> A sip of water and um, so yeah I wanted to have a look at the um, makeup of the parish and you'll find some extra information in your extra materials um, on your film strip when you're viewing images of the 1921 census um, you've got your plans of division um, which contain a written description of the boundaries of an enumeration district um, as well as a map and we all love maps here and um, sometimes they come with a little slip um, like this one and this note says this slip compiled 19 
of February 1925 shows the constitution on census day 1921. No change between census day and 19th of February 1925. Um, so this is for the registration district of Petworth, um, it's a rural district, and we can see uh, for Tolworth on that um, the lower list uh, near the bottom there, uh, along with the other surrounding towns and villages. So you've got your really tiny villages of Burton and Coates, um, with sort of 40 or so people. <laughs> And um, Fittleworth is one of the slightly larger ones. Um, so there are 639 people in the parish of Fittleworth at the time of the census. And um, we've got this, I've put this big yellow arrow there just uh, pointing to Fittleworth. Um, it's under uh, the bit that um, just says uh, Southern there. Um, so um, Matthew, he's got, he's got Petworth ancestors as well. I love this. <laughs> this will be um, a very useful session for you. Okay. Um, and one of the places I've spent a bit of time at in Fittleworth is the pub. Um, it may surprise some people. And uh, this is the pub. It is uh, called The Swan, still around uh, to this day. And I found this lovely picture of The Swan, um, which is described as the favoured resort of artists and anglers in one of our newspapers. Um, so this is a picture um, from July 1904. And if you haven't had a go on our new newspaper experience, what have you been doing? It is amazing. Um, so you've got your film strip there at the bottom that you can browse through. And I love, I love, love, love that you can now um, clip out um, images or articles um, and you can add them to your tree. Um, you can um, download them, copy and paste them. Simply stunning. Anyway, back to the 1921 census. And um, I found the census record uh, for the swan by popping swan into my keywords and putting um, Fittleworth in the location. And here we are. Um, so we've got a nice uh, a nice and big EE form. Um, so that's for the larger households. And it's headed up by Harry Thorpe Oliver, who is 48 and he's a widower and he's from Luton. And he is the hotel proprietor. So alongside him are four others, they're all women, and um, there was, seems there were no guests here on census night, so uh, the Swan, as well as being a pub, also a hotel. So we've got the manageress, who is May Sybil Miller, who's 37, from Suffolk. We've got Charlotte Maud Feast, a barmaid, who is 23, and also from Suffolk, and she comes from the same place as May, uh, the manageress, they're both from Winston in Suffolk. And we've got Florence Louise Hazelden, who is 23 and a waitress, and she's married. And finally, Annie Beatrice Geel, who is 21 and a chambermaid. Um, so both um, Florence and Annie are born in Fittleworth, and we can see that the pub is, is well staffed. Um, May is at the top of the food chain, and we've got Annie there as the chambermaid um, at the bottom there. Um, and what is really great um, about Find My Past is that we can add that little bit of extra colour, although admittedly this is sort of black and white, um, but you get my meaning uh, to our census records. And you can actually see inside the swan from this time. Um, and from that census return, we know that there were 12 rooms at the swan. And on the left, you can see the dining room there from um, 1914. And also there's a view from outside of the pub there on the right. And this is actually from 1921. And I wonder if it is Harry Thorpe Oliver there standing outside his pub uh, next to a motor car talking to a couple of women. And if you look really closely, there's a little dog. Now, these are from our wonderful um, Francis Frith collection. So I've simply just searched the place, Fittleworth, um, and you can see that there's descriptions I could see uh, it was tagged up with the swan. So you can really um, locate yourself um, within the village and understand the, the very fabric of the census, I suppose, and how things actually looked then. So I wanted to dive into this census record a little bit more. And one of the curiosities for me was 23-year-old um, Florence Hazelden, who was noted as being married. Um, where is her husband? Um, so I searched for a marriage between Florence Louise and a Hazelden. And voila, I found uh, this marriage record at the top there between uh, Florence L. Geel and Charles Hazelden from Petworth, uh, the nearby town, in 1918. Um, so we actually find out that Charles Hazelden had served um, during, in the work, oh, my words, I apologise, Charles Hazelden had actually served in the Royal Navy during the First World War. And we have his service record in our British Royal Navy Seaman collection. I love this collection so much because there's so many details that you can glean, uh, glean from it. It's just 
packed packed with information my uh I actually it was on that particular record um that I found out my great grandfather where he was born wonderful stuff and um, so we learn um Charles's birthday his birthplace um how uh, before uh joining the Royal Navy that he was a wages clerk that he was five foot six and a half with sandy hair blue eyes and a fresh complexion so we can almost picture him um, and there's an interesting note here that he joined up on the 7th of September 1914, as he says, during hostilities, um, he was 27. So this, this wasn't a, a first career step for Charles. Um, and it was him joining up, we suppose, in response to the war. And true to his civilian occupation, his rating is SSA. I had to look this one up. Um, he was a ship's steward assistant. And um, he had a, a VG, very good character, and a, and a superior ability. A very well-rounded chap. And as for Florence Louise Giel, Giel, kind of that, that's unusual. Um, that was the surname of our chambermaid at the Swan in 1921, Annie. And a look at the 1911 census reveals the pair to be sisters. Um, Florence Giel, um, 13, and Annie Giel, uh, 10, um, with their parents Walter and Louise, and they were living in Fitterworth. But where was Charles Hazelden in the 1921 census? Well, the answer to that is that he was very, very, very close to home indeed. Um, so 33-year-old Charles Hazelden is in the very busy home of his parents-in-law, Walter and Louise Giel. Um, so Walter is a farm carter and Charles is working as a plasterer. And the home is really not too far away from the Swan. Um, it's on Lower Street. And actually, it's one of the buildings. It's basically that building there. <laughs> the building um, you can kind of see behind that motor car there. So he's, he's really he's really close by. Um, and um, yeah, so he's living in this, this busy family. He's living with five of Florence's brothers and sisters. There's also a boarder. Uh, the boarder is a gardener who is working for Harry Oliver, the Swan's proprietor. Um, so everyone in the countryside is connected. And um, enumerated just above the border is Winifred Evelyn Hazelden, who at just nine months is the household's youngest occupant. And she is Charles and Florence's baby daughter. So I think that kind of tells you something of the economic situation here. And um, within the family, Florence is um, needing to work. She's staying um, away at the hotel, um, whilst presumably her family helped bring up um, her daughter. And that's the story of Florence. Um, she passed away in 1976 and stayed in the area. Um, but what of the hotel's owner, Harry Thorpe Oliver? Now, we find him in the 1911 census, uh, living not too far away in the town of Petworth. Um, he's not a hotel proprietor. He's an auctioneer and surveyor, valuer and estate agent. Um, so I guess you could say that he was in property. Um, he's living with his wife, Bessie, and both of them were born in um, Bedfordshire. They'd been married for 11 years and have a servant named Margaret and a boarder named Thomas, who was also a surveyor, estate agent and auctioneer. Uh, but by 1921, we know that Harry Oliver is a widower. And I will admit this did stump me a little bit um, as I struggled to find a death for a Bessie Oliver in, in that time frame, that, that 10 year time frame. So 1911 to 1921. So I went back and I researched Harry's marriage. Um, so we find a marriage record um, and find out that Bessie's uh, name is actually Sarah Elizabeth. Um, made her name of Braun. So it seems that she she went by Bessie instead. Um, and I came across this death record for a Sarah E. Oliver from 1916 in Petworth. Um, so we can deduce that this is indeed Paul Bessie's um, death record. Um, so fast forward to 1939, and Harry must have liked life as hotel proprietor at the Swan. He is still in his position and has remarried to May Sybil who was listed as the hotel proprietoress. And on the eve of war in 1939, unlike in 1921, the hotel actually has guests. Um, one 
uh, Sidney Lee. Um, he is an artist. Um, indeed, he's a royal um, academician. Um, indeed, he was very well known for his engravings. And you might remember from a while back that caption of the, of the photograph of this one um, being the favoured resort of anglers and artists. And Sydney is just one of these visiting artists. And he's staying there alongside his wife, Edith, and another guest, the wonderfully named Hotspur P. Sladen. Um, Hotspur is listed as a licensee, so he might be connected to the pub. Um, and like in the 1921 census, there are the pub's other staff members. Um, we have Charlotte M. Feast, ring a bell. She has a rather lengthy annotation, and they've done well with the numerator on this 1939 register, and they've been very thorough. Um, so it says that she's companion to sister, brackets above. So her sister is May Oliver, assisting in hotel, brackets unpaid. And also working at the Swan is Dorothy V. Elliott, chambermaid, and Nora P. Elliott, a waitress. So what has happened here? Harry Oliver has married his hotel manager from 1921, May Sybil Miller. Oh, I'm, I might be reading too much into this, but I'm not sure how much romance was perhaps involved in this match, because they weren't actually married until 1937. So... Harry had been a widower for at least over 20 years, and the pair had been working together since 1921, so they'd been working together for 16 years, so perhaps it was something of a slow burn. And tracing May's family history at first was a little bit tricky. Um, in 1921, her surname is actually spelt um, with an A, it's, it's a Millar with an A, and likewise in the marriage record too. Um, as per 1939, we learn that Charlotte Feast is her sister, which threw me a little too. So we've got two different surnames here, Feast and Miller. Miller was definitely May's maiden name. Um, she was single in 1921. So I searched in Suffolk, uh, which was where the sisters were from, with the, uh, the surname Miller spelled with an E, um, so the sort of more conventional Miller. Um, and we go all the way back to the 1881 census here to find 10-month-old May Miller living with her parents, uh, Henry, who was a hawker, and Charlotte. So we've got that, that familiar name there. And actually, May Miller was one of a huge family. And um, when I started to put her tree together, she was one of 14 siblings. Um, and actually, really sadly, um, she was named for her twin sisters, Beatrice May and Maud Sybil, who were born in um, 1878 and passed away in 1879. So uh, May Sybil uh, is born in 1881, so a few years after their death. And as for her sister Charlotte Feast, well, May's father passed away in 1891, her mother remarried, uh, he was a chap called uh, George Feast, and along came Charlotte in 1897, the youngest child. Um, so there was 16 years actually between um, Charlotte and May, and so they must have been close, um, Charlotte living with her sister in Fittleworth um, and assisting at her place of work for free. And actually, there were 16 years between um, myself and my sister, and we were this close growing up, so that's nice um, to see some, some lovely and close sisters. Um, and yeah, let's let's take a look into the newspapers as well. Um, given the uh, uh, the Oliver's position in society, I thought um, we might find something about them in local newspapers, and um, we did. Uh, the first mention is from the West Sussex Gazette, so that's a local paper that was published um, in nearby Arundel, another lovely town. Now, the first on the left hand side details Harry Thorpe Oliver's brush with the law in August 1938. Um, so two police constables named Sutton and Potter were outside Fittleworth Church when they noticed a very old car, a 15 year old car. And also I was reading this thinking, you know, it's 19, 1930, um, 1938 and we're talking about a very old car and we kind of think, cars are quite new then um so that amused me as as did the fact of sort of two police constables walking around the village or, you know probably would, wouldn't be happening nowadays um so basically the two police uh constables they inspected the windscreen of this car and noticed that it was not made out of the the required safety glass um 
Harry Oliver then arrives on the scene. Uh, he hands over his license, which actually turns out is expired. It expired two years before in 1936. So he gets summoned to the Petworth Petty Sessions. Um, he, he pleads guilty to driving without a license, um, but not guilty to the uh, lack of safety glass charge. Um, he said that he was told that the glass was unbreakable when he bought the car. Um, in, in the event, the, uh, the tr that particular charge was dropped and he was fined two pounds for driving without a license. Um, and again, that picture of the, the people standing outside the Swan in 1921, there's a car. I'm not sure it is this particular car. We, we get told that the car is 15 years old in 1938. So that would make it that he bought it in 1923. So a few years um, after um, everything. Um, oh, Matthew asking, am I still here? Um, you are still here. Did I miss anything? Well, we were diving through uh, the 1921 census uh, of Fittleworth still and looking at the uh, the life of um, Swan Hotel proprietor Harry Thorpe Oliver. Um, so, yeah, I, I enjoyed this one because we get a, uh, this particular article because we get a great snapshot of um, of um, Harry Oliver's life and personality. And um, the next uh, article that I found was from the 2nd of August, 1956. And there's another article about Harry Oliver in the West Sussex Gazette. And this time it's sadly uh, about his death, but we get a lot of information from it. We learned that he actually has spent 38 years as licensee of the Swan. And we also learned that the Swan was home of the now forgotten ancient order of thrust blowers, which helped charities. And Mr. Oliver did much to raise funds for it. So that was something um, that um, I didn't know about the Swan at all, the ancient order of thrust blowers. So Harry Oliver seems immensely charitable. Um, he raised money for the Royal West Sussex Hospital in Chichester. He was really sporty as well. He was a member of the Luton Swimming Club. He played rugby for Brighton, Devon County and Plymouth. And he also was a life member of Sussex County Cricket Club. And we learned the origins of his former career too. Uh, he worked with a form, uh, sorry, he worked with a firm of auctioneers since 1900. So we've got so much information about him. And just one line, six words at the end, which reads, he is survived by his widow. So I just feel sort of slants of um, frostiness here, um, possibly in this relationship between Harry and May. Um, oh yeah, and Kim, um, my granddad learned to drive in World War II, but never had a license. He kept on driving until the late 1960s. My grandfather was exactly the same. Um, and, um, yeah, I do. I don't think he had a license. <laughs> um, scary. <laughs> but he was a good driver. He was a good driver, though. I was in his car many times and I survived. Um, so let's get back to the 1921 census. And this time we're at the home of the Elliots. Uh, in the 1939 register, we have two Elliots, uh, Dorothy and Nora, who were living and working at the Swan. And we can find the two when they, they were very young. Um, in the 1921 census, and they were indeed sisters. And we can find them at the age of um, four and two, living with their parents, um, William and Fanny Elliot in Eggdean, um, which is a tiny village, um, the next village along um, from Fitterworth. Um, so William is a hewer. Um, there's actually quite a few quarries in the area. And um, he and his wife have four children as of 1921. And I found this particular census return really interesting because we learned the full names of both Dorothy and Nora. So Dorothy is Dorothy Vimy Elliot, and Nora is actually Peace Nora Elliot. So they're unusual names, aren't they? Um, so it seems that Dorothy has her middle name um, from the Battle of Vimy Ridge, um, which took place during the First World War in April 1917. And so just uh, a month later in May, Dorothy was born. Um, so it was a tradition at the time for children to be named after these battles of the First World War um, to commemorate lost loved ones, for example. And then we have Peace Nora. She was born in March 1919. So looking at about five months after the armistice. So there was a tradition, too, of naming babies after the peace. So you've got names like Peace um, and Armistice and even Victory appearing. 
And we can find such names uh, in the 1921 census. Um, so we've got, uh, this is Peace uh, Elliot's birth record here. Later on in life, she does go by Nora. Um, we, in, in the 1939 register, she's down as Nora. Uh, with another war on the horizon in 1939, it must have been a difficult name to go by, Peace. Um, but she wasn't alone. There were other pieces out there. And you can see um, just a snapshot of a list of pieces um, from 1921. And there's another piece, uh, Peace Chandler. Uh, she was living not too far away from Peace Elliot uh, in Midhurst in West Sussex. And we've got all these pieces here. We've got um, Peace Carpenter, uh, Peace Chell, Peace Chandler, Peace Doris Dakin, and Peace Donegan. And all these pieces have their ages listed in 1921 as two years and seven months. So that's exactly the time since the armistice. So they, they must have been born just as the piece was happening. Um, our own piece, Peace Elliot, she was a little bit late for that particular group, but that, that sense of relief uh, that the war was over was strong enough to carry on to her birth in March 1919. And like uh, Dorothy Vimy Elliot, there are plenty of other examples of battle names in the 1921 census. So at the top there, we've got uh, the Mansfield-born Yeep Verdun Dickinson, uh, a little boy who was five at the time of the census. Um, and then we've got Durham-born um, Doris Som Burbeck below him, and um, one-year-old um, Lucy Passchendaele Hoadley, as well as Hampshire-born Annie Margaret Gallipoli Bye. And there's also a six-year-old boy there in the middle, Mons Marn Mitchell, and some, some really fascinating naming patterns. And it is said that these children were named for their deceased fathers as a way of preserving and marking their memory. And I, you know, this is often the case, but in the case of Dorothy and Fimi and these, these other five children listed here, you can see that it's noted that their parents are actually still both alive. So perhaps they were named to commemorate other lost relatives or, or friends or Perhaps it symbolizes sort of how total this, this war was. Um, it, it was so pervasive that it had taken over the cultural imagination. So even after the war ended, so Lucy Passchendaele, she's one. So this, she would have been born after the war. Um, and Annie Margaret Gallipoli, um, you know, she was one. So she was born a, a while after the Gallipoli campaign. Um, so we, we see that these, these, these names sort of, they hang on um, even after the war has finished. So I think, I think it, it, you know, it's really moving. It's sort of that lest we forget um, men, mentality. And um, I'm ending our, our visit to the, to the village of Fitterworth today with a visit to the big house. Um, this is Fitterworth House, uh, which is pictured here in 1908 in our Francis Thrift collection. And uh, it's a shortish walk from the Swan, and it still stands today, and it is really beautiful. I walk past here most days and dream of living there, um, alas. Um, and in 1921, the household is an exclusively female one. Um, again, um, we're in the shadow of war. We know a generation of men have been wiped out, so it's not something we should be sort of too surprised about. Um, heading it up is 45 year old uh, Julia Kathleen, Julia Catherine Rosalind Duquesne. What a name. Um, she's of independent means, she's single, um, and she was born in um, Roehampton, so Surrey, London. We love this for Julia. She's, she's living her life in the big house, and uh, just enumerated below her is Mary Barbara Murray. She's 24 and likewise of independent means. Um, Mary is Julia's niece, as we can see. It's, uh, it's actually been crossed out on the original uh, and it's been replaced by the word visitor. So living with them, we've got six servants. Uh, the oldest is the cook, 29-year-old Violet May Pattle, and the youngest is 15-year-old Ethel May Howard, the under housemaid, the lower, lowest of the low. Ethel comes from nearby West Chiltington, whilst fellow 15-year-old and the under parlour maid, Doris Mary Whittington, is from Fittleworth, and she's the only one of the household to be actually from Fittleworth. And the household also consists of a kitchen maid, a parlour maid, and a housemaid, so a really, really busy staff. Um, however, the, the big house um, did not belong to Julia Duquesne, 
It's a wonderful name. Uh, indeed, the schedule notes one um, Louis C. Duquesne as being the name of the person responsible for making the return. Um, so Louis was actually Julia's elder brother. And um, as we can see from this family tree that I made earlier, we've got another big family. They were two out of 10 siblings. And actually, Julia was a twin. And she and her sister Isabel, they were the youngest of their family. And I found researching uh, the Duquesnes uh, quite interesting on a few points. They're very, they're a very aristocratic family. Um, you've got the Duquesne side and the mother's side guest. Um, you can see uh, that the mother, Charlotte, her her brother married a Spencer Churchill, um, a lady, um, so the daughter of the Duke of Marlborough. And I found this really remarkable because out of 10 children, only one, the eldest, Alicia Maria, had children. And one of them was Mary Barbara Murray, who is present at Fitzworth House in the 1921 census. And none of these children die young. None of them do, um, apart from Sylvia Duquesne. But she's 37. So it, it's not, you know, for the time, you know, all these children survived. And we can't, you know, I don't want to sort of oversimplify this, but I wonder here if economic factors were, were a reason, particularly in the case of the sisters, they just didn't have to marry. And um, we see that Julia is of independent means. So there's just no need for her financially. You know, we, we don't have a sort of Jane Austen, Mr. Bennett situation where there's an entail and, and he needs to marry off his daughters because they won't survive. This isn't, this isn't that. Um, and also, you know, then there's no need for Louis and Arthur to enter into marriage. The boys here, um, you know, sort of a Downton Abbey situation where the Earl has to marry a rich American heiress to sort of secure the mansion. There's no need. Um, so Richard and Charlotte Duquesne had 10 children and only three grandchildren. Fascinating. Anyway, uh, Louis Duquesne, who owned Fitzworth House, he was a solicitor, uh, so he had a career. And uh, we can see his probate record there. And I always come back to the probate collection it is so useful um you can get the date of death and um you can it enables you to see uh the amount that a person left uh when they died um so probate is granted to um louis's two brothers richard and arthur and is valued at just under eighty nine thousand pounds which is a cool uh four million pounds in today's money um so it came around to 1939 and who's living at Fitzworth House? Well, it's Julia and her sister Isabel and um, it seems they lived at the house and until they passed away. Um, now, um, I don't usually investigate such aristocratic lineages, it's sort of out of my comfort zone. Um, so I, I had to go back to our um, under parliament, Doris Mary Whittington. Um, and the top there, um, is her school admissions record um, from 1910. And again, that school admissions records, really useful. We're able to find her uh, date of birth um, from that. And so this record, this school record is from 1910. And we learned that she was born on the 11th of July, 1905. We also learned when she left school um, in 1914. So she was about nine. Um, this was the village school. This was for Fitzworth Village School. And um, so she might have gone on to, to further education. Um, Below that is the 1911 census, which shows that she is living with her parents, um, Jesse and Mary Ann Whittington in Bedham. Um, Bedham is a hamlet very near to Fitterworth. Um, and she's living with her sister, her little sister Winifred, and her uncle, uh, George Budd. And then I must admit um, that her appearance to me in the 1921 census, um, Doris became something of a um, mystery to me. Um, we find her family, um, Mary and her sister Winifred, living in Fittleworth in the 1939 register, still with um, Uncle George, Uncle George Budd, who is noted as being a retired roadman, an old age pensioner, but no Doris. And of course, it's quite possible that Doris, um, sorry, it's quite possible that she's married. But of the marriages I've looked at, nothing quite fits. Um, so I searched for her sister, um, Winifred Jessie, um, who passed away in 1963, and um, found her probate records. Interestingly, probate um, from Winifred is granted to one Barbara May Lamech. Interesting, because Barbara's maiden name is Barbara Whittington. A Barbara M. Whittington was born in Worthing, Sussex in 1935, and her mother's maiden name is Whittington. So could her mother have been the elusive Doris Whittington? Um, Doris and Winifred had no other siblings. 
And perhaps Doris changed her name after having an illegitimate child. Who knows? That is um, one for me uh, to, to chase down. And we, we, we love, um, we do love a um, mystery here. Um, I love that. And Victoria, the naming patterns. And for Nelson, my family tree, no doubt named after the famous Horatio Nelson as a baby, was born the year he died. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, oh, stockbrokers, Kim Phillies found a few of those in the 1910s and 1920s, lots of money servants. Not much of either in the 1939 register, though. Well, yeah, you know, we had, it was boom and bust, wasn't it? Um, and um, Anya, they seem to have a lot of daughters. Maybe the reason they only had three grandchildren was because the daughters were unable to find suitable husbands after world war one i think i think this is this is quite possible um they are they are sort of they were born in the the 1870s um so it does it does put them as a sort of a little bit before that that lost generation but again um definitely something to 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 bear in mind there with with so many daughters um to marry off um, in that time well thank you everybody um, for joining me today i hope you um enjoyed our um walkthroughs and fiddleworth history and the 1921 census um it's great i didn't realize we, we were so connected to to fiddleworth um here at the community that was lovely um so i do hope you um have a lovely weekend we will be back uh, at the same time next week 4 p.m and um have hope you all have lovely weekends um wherever you are and for those of you with with some rain i'm going to send you some some warmth and sun from London. Thank you very much and take care. Bye-bye.